So, welcome. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, Infura, how we're hooked on it, and what we're going to do about it. My name is Jason Carver. I work at the Ethereum Foundation uh, on all sorts of Python tooling, as well as the Trinity Python client. Let's get started. So, why are we hooked to Infura? Obviously, it's delicious. Um, it is an obvious thing for dApp developers to uh, make it as easy as possible for new people to sign up and use their app. You know? And uh, similarly, plugins like MetaMask, uh, Gnosis Safe, and so on are, have the same incentives, right? So uh, Infura is a way to skip the install of the node, uh, skip the syncing of the node, and get people on board. Fairly obvious uh, setup why that's easier and more pleasant for a lot of users. And frankly, for a lot of casual users, you know, 80 to 90% of people, they're always going to minimize effort. They're, they're very willing to make trade offs about um, trust and uh, custodianship to, uh, to make it easy. Um, but there is a set of users that we're interested in the sophisticated users, whether that's hobbyists or people writing scripts to interact with the chain, and they're willing to do more. Um, they're willing to put in some more effort. So the problem is when they try that, they go out and look for documentation, uh, they look for help in the apps, and they don't find anything. It's all built for that 80% user, and so they just skip over it, and, uh, and they often don't have any trigger later to, uh, to switch over to something different. So maybe that's okay, you know, how, how bad is that? What, how big of a problem is that? Well, um, you know, there's some obvious ones like concerns about downtime, um, you know, and fear is gonna be a single point of failure, uh, no matter how good their systems are, and they're very good. Um, uh, perhaps uh, the worst is that Infura makes a bad hire, or someone cracks into their systems, and they serve you bad data. Now, they can't explicitly, directly, uh, say, send your funds from one account to another or your assets. But if they can control the view of the world you have, uh, it is pretty straightforward to get you to send funds or assets to the, whatever address they choose. For example, by resolving an ENS name to a different address than the real main net would. Um, and some other things like leaking private data, everything about who you are and what you're doing is going out to, uh, to Infura and the other uh, apps along the way. And slightly more subtly, um, the, more, the more people, the fewer people that are running nodes, the easier it is to spin up other nodes and do slight manipulations uh, like eclipse attacks. <clears throat> so, uh, it's here, it's a problem. What are we going to do about it? Well, uh, there's a lot of different avenues to approach this with. Uh, there is uh, dedicated hardware like DAPNode or Grid Plus. Um, there's people looking at the problem of how much storage it takes uh, to, to use on your computer. There's people looking at peer discovery. Um, and uh, the thing that we've found to be uh, one of the biggest pain points is just the amount of time that it takes to sync from a fresh start. You know, these uh, sophisticated users who are willing to try something out, they're hobbyists, they like to tinker, um, but they'll start up a node and try to sync it, and two hours later have no indication about how far they are into that sync, and say, screw it, flip it off, and go do something else that's more fun to tinker with. So, um, we want to fix that problem. The, the reigning speed champion is Geth's fast sync. That's the, um, the one to beat. That's about four hours, uh, according to their latest benchmarks. Um, so, you know, even that is going to be uh, a problem uh, for, for these users. And so, we want to take a look at that and see how much better can we do. Um, and part of the reason we're asking that question is, if we directly implement FastSync, we're gonna do a lot worse because Python is never gonna match or beat Go in a head-to-head -head performance race. So, um, we zoom into FastSync 
and we say, uh, we look at what parts are taking most of the time, and the majority of that is downloading state. Okay, there's things like downloading the headers, downloading uh, receipts, but downloading the state of a recent block, which includes all the things like accounts and uh, storage for contracts. That's the vast majority. So what are we gonna do? It's time to upgrade uh, our sync process. So this um, next generation of sync we're calling uh, Beam Sync, and uh, the, the ability it gives us is to go from an empty node uh, no data to executing a recent mainnet block in minutes, asterisk, uh, with just-in-time state downloads. That's the uh, main concept behind it. So, uh, asterisk, uh, I don't want to lie to you, uh, it takes longer than that right now because you have to find peers, and that's uh, unreasonably difficult right now, and uh, header imports can take a while unless you use a checkpoint which has its own Interesting side tracks. Um, we will get back to those things, but um, we're not. We're considering that out of scope for Beam Sync right now. So, uh, high level, how does Beam Sync work? Um, roughly, we combine the ideas of the way that Fast Sync works and the way that uh, Stateless Clients works. So, Stateless Client gets all the data it needs, just the data it needs to run a block, and it uh, dumps it at the end of the block. Uh, FastSync is about getting all of the data uh, all up front and save it to disk. So uh, instead, BeamSync works by running the EVM on an empty state, uh, pulling the data as it's needed, but saving it and storing it um, for future executions. So what kind of effect does that have? Well, there are about um, 375 million uh, trinodes in the mainnet state database. And there are roughly three to 4,000 trinodes uh, that are used per block. So that's about one 100,000th of the amount of data you need for just one block versus for everything in the state. And uh, this works out to about 250 times fewer requests on the network uh, before the first block can run. And we'll get into those numbers a little bit more later. So, uh, we are approaching halfway through and obviously only gra glazed, graced over um, Beam Sync. Uh, so I've got a talk, or a, a post here rather, um, on Medium uh, that goes into a bit more detail, compares it to fasting and all that. So I'll give people a second to grab that link. Um, and also I'm going to be posting a further Beam Sync. Uh, updates as well as talking about how it impacts the whole network over time. So uh, feel free to follow me there to find out more. Um, and while people are getting their last shot of that, um, you may have noticed kind of a discrepancy in the numbers on the last slide. If there's 100,000th of the data, then why is it only 250 times fewer requests? Excellent question. So. Um, FastSync gets to batch together its trinode requests uh, into 340 no 384 nodes per request. Um, so BeamSync, as implemented now, uh, can only request a single node per request. And because the latency, the actual time that the packet is round tripping between you and your peer, makes up the majority of the time, uh, you lose a factor of 384. Okay, so um, we're about to do a deep dive. I'm sorry for the folks that uh, I might lose. Uh, it requires a little bit of understanding about EVM and the way that, that tries work. I'm not gonna have time to give background on it. Um, so I'm sorry for everyone else. I hope you have fun. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna uh, paint a big picture of kind of how it works, but I'm gonna put it on the slide bit by bit so that uh, we can kind of stitch it together, the understanding. So the idea here is um, we're going to jump into uh, EVM code execution. This isn't the way it really works, um, but it, it uh, gets the point across. So let's say we have a push 20 op code. We're, we're gonna push an address onto the stack. That didn't take, that didn't require any state. That was just in the uh, the bytecode, so even though our state database is empty, uh, we can continue on. Okay, but the next opcode asks for the balance of that address. 
So now, the EVM has to check the state database, which is empty, and, uh, and try to extract that balance. Now, all we know at this point, all the node knows at this point, is the hash of the root of the try. So that is, uh, we're gonna call that f here, f dot dot dot. And uh, that's, that's all we've got. So what are we gonna do? How are we gonna get the balance? We're gonna find a friendly peer, and we'll ask it. Hey, peer, do you know what the node is that has the hash f? This command is the exact same command that FastSync uses, right? So um, we're piggybacking on this. We don't require any new uh, network protocols to make beam sync happen. So we say, peer, give us, can you give us f? And they say, sure. Uh, the node f has children a and b. So what does that mean? It means that the hashes of the children of node f are a and b. Um, you know, I'm lying to you a little bit here, uh, pretending this is a binary tree rather than a modified Patricia Merkel tree. Uh, still gets a point across. So uh, we get a and b back, and we store it in our database. So here's what our local try looks like now. We've got two children. We don't know what are inside them. Uh, we have the root node. And um, what happens at this point, now we're looking for the balance of a particular address, and we know which address we're looking for. So we don't have to fill out the whole tree, we can just follow the path to the address we want. So let's say the path takes us down, uh, down A, and so uh, we wanna know what the children of A are. So we ask our peer, hey, what's the, what are the children of A? It says the children are D and E. We save that into our database. Okay, so now we, we're starting to build just a few pieces that are necessary to get at the balance of the address that we care about. And so we do the same thing again, where we know a particular address that we're looking for the balance for. Uh, let's say it's down, uh, you're uh, meant to follow down the path to E, and we ask our peer, and they say, hey, E is actually a leaf node. It contains the RLP of the account, and uh, which includes things like the balance that you're interested in. So we save that in, uh, in the uh, state database. So now we've got three nodes in the state database. That's enough to not only know the balance, but prove that that balance is part of the state route from the, the previous block. Um, and so at this point, we can read the balance out of that leaf node and push it onto the stack and continue, resume going down the EVM. So let's say, you know, the, the bytecode wants to know if the balance was non-empty. So this is the gist of it. You can see, um, you know, uh, later on, it, maybe a different balance is asked for. Again, you'd be asking for nodes one by one. You get to skip the root node next time. Um, but, uh, you know, the same concept applies. Uh, similarly, um, this is showing you know, three layers. The real main net's closer to six or seven, um, probably at this point, depending on you know, where the account is. So um, how long does that take? So let's say there are 3,000 nodes uh, per block, and we only get to request one node in each request. And we're connected to peers, but we can only ask one peer at a time. So we get to ask our best peer. We get uh, the one that, in this case, best means we're closest to, that'll round trip fastest. So let's say that uh, our best peer is 100 milliseconds away. So you uh, work that all out. You get 300 seconds of time waiting for state for a block. And that kind of sounds like a problem. Uh, you can imagine if it takes five minutes to download the state for a block, then you're gonna lag behind uh, the net and then uh, as you process the next block, you're gonna lag further, um, that would not be tenable. But the good news is we don't have to wait for the first block to finish before we start executing the second one. So what ends up happening is uh, you continue to uh, run these all in parallel and, uh, and you catch up along the way, but you know, maybe stay perpetually five minutes behind mainnet. Um, in reality, it might look something more like fluctuating between 15 minutes behind and one minute behind, uh, depending on the blocks that you're running into and your peers and all that. Okay, so at this point, uh, you know, you're a few minutes, you've turned on your node, you're five minutes in, maybe some more minutes for peer discovery and headers, and you've got mainnet blocks executing on your local node. 
Um, this is already a way better experience than four hours or sometimes days to run FastSync. Um, but it's not good enough. So uh, how can we do better? Um, one of the things we can do is to find out from our peers um, which nodes, which try nodes, are going to be needed in a block, right? So we're gonna call that the block witness metadata, where the witness is all the state needed to execute the block, and the metadata is just the hashes of the state that's needed to execute the block. So um, what that allows us to do is batch up the requests again into 384 nodes per request, and it allows us to spread those requests across multiple peers. Uh, so a uh, quick look, this is gonna look very similar to the past one, so we'll go through a little bit faster um, of what that might look like. So push an address onto the stack, ask for its balance, hit the empty state database, all we know is the root hash, find a peer to help us out. And now instead of asking for that root node, what we do is we get a witness, really I'd probably call it witness metadata or something. Um, and we know which block we're on, of course, so we can say, hey, peer, can you tell us which hashes we're gonna need for block G? They say, sure, we're gonna need F, A, and E uh, from last, last time. So, you know, at this point, we actually can't store anything in the database. We just have a bunch of keys. We don't have any key value pairs. And in fact, we don't know how these stitch together. Um, all we really know is F's at the root. Um, but we can use it to now make the next request. So we can uh, batch them together, put them in a single request, we can send it to a different peer, we can send it to, uh, we can split it up and send it to a bunch of different peers. Um, we have a lot of options. And so we get back uh, essentially all the data that, that was requested uh, in the previous slide. Uh, so we know F is, has children A and B, A has children D and E, and E is the account RLP. So we save it into the database, that's enough, we can look up and prove the account balance and push it onto the stack and then ask follow-up questions like, is that balance zero, um, which is you know, a stateless call. Okay, so how much does that help us? Well, uh, let's run some numbers. So let's say, again, 3,000 try nodes per block, um, rough number. And, but this time we get to group it into 384 at a time. And you know, we're, again, assuming, and this looks about right from empirical tests, that most of the time spent is latency. So um, we get to group it up, and we get to also split it up. So we get to send these requests to, let's say, four different peers at, at once. And now that we're sending it to more than our best peer, you know, maybe the average uh, round trip time actually goes up. You know, the, we have to rely on some peers that are a little further away. Um, and so maybe each peer takes 500 milliseconds to round trip. Um, and so all of that, uh, throw it into, uh, you know, throw some arithmetic at it, and you get one second of time waiting on try node requests. So uh, this is a uh, uh, prediction, right? The other one is, is known, um, but this is a fairly straightforward extension um, that we're looking at that would be pretty much the whole game, right? If you can download all the state in one second for a block, you can keep up uh, with mainnet quite easily uh, from the beginning of launching an empty node. So uh, how close are we? Well, uh, V0 is prototyped in Trinity Alpha. The, uh, that works on mainnet right now. So uh, we have executed many mainnet blocks uh, over and over uh, and um, you know, generated local witnesses, that kind of thing. But uh, it's not production ready. Um, you know, it's, this is meant for experimentation right now, uh, but there's nothing left uh, to research, right? There's no, um, there's no open questions really on, on V0 and how it works, just some more coding to do. Now the witness metadata uh, serving is in its design phase, right? So uh, we have ideas about how to do that. That's gonna be coming up next right after DevCon. Um, you know, follow us to see uh, how that progresses. And um, people sometimes ask the question, well, why hasn't anyone done this before? And the answer is that 
uh, no one had to. You know, we were forced to do it because Python is slow. So we had to ask these questions. Um, there's a chicken and the egg problem with why, uh, why we can't, couldn't use witnesses right away in v0 because there were no serv servers of those witnesses. And so Trinity uh, can't serve them uh, until it syncs. So we're gonna bootstrap with v0 in order to sync v1. So that's it. We're, uh, we're doing this now. We're talking to other clients to get it done for them. Uh, it's a great thing about working at the foundation is we get to share all the fun toys that we um, make up. And uh, we're, we're cranking away. So follow us and uh, see what's new. It looks like we don't have time for questions, um, but you can find me on the side or in the hall. I'm happy to talk. Thanks for your time.